Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our week five, uh, well, um, week six review session. This week, we have learned more about uh, probability, and uh, we also calculated Jerry, we lost audio. Still lost, Jerry. I can't hear you. Cut again. There you go. Uh, okay. Uh, could you hear me at all? How about now? Perfect. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Gotcha. I no didn't problem. realize it. <laughs> okay. Usually I wear my earphones, so uh, it's clear to hear. All right. Um, I was saying that uh, this week we have uh, learned uh, probability and how to calculate probability as well as a conditional probability. I hope it's not too difficult a week, uh, but uh, before we head into our homework questions, uh, let's have a very short review. First, uh, I have a small question. Uh, what is probability? Could anyone give me a very intuitive uh, description or definition? The probability of me getting A in this class is How much? <laughs> <laughs> you told me, Jerry. <laughs> It'll be one because for a certain event, and the probability is one. For impossible event, the probability is zero. And uh, uh, that brings us to a very important pr uh, property of uh, probabilities. It's always a fraction between zero and one. So if you ever calculated a probability that's outside of zero and one, there must be something wrong. So that you can use that as a checkpoint. All right. Um, so talking about probability, let's uh, have an Excuse example. Me. Excuse me, Jerry. Can you repeat last part? Because uh, Interesting. I'm not sure whether it's because of my audio then, probably, uh, probably, okay, probably uh, the, the Zoom server is struggling with audio signals. Um, okay, now uh, the, um, once we understand that uh, probability is a fraction between zero and one, and it can take values exactly at zero and at one. We should also um, have some intuitive understanding about uh, what probability means. For example, a very common um, scenario where we use or hear probability is uh, uh, in weather forecasts. Most forecasts come with a probability. So for example, um, the chance of rain. If I say the chance of rain tomorrow is a 10% or 0 0.10, what does it mean? Could one of you give me an uh, intuitive um, interpretation of uh, what a 10% probability of uh, raining uh, means? Hello, could you hear my last part? Yes. Oh, okay. We could hear you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, was it Morgan? Would you want to try? That'd be a long shot, but there's a one in 10 chance that it's going to rain. Um, how would you describe a one in 10 chance? Does it mean that uh, 
for example, in, in if this forecast was for Irvine and Irvine uh, covers about uh, 20 square miles, does it mean two square miles out of 20 would have rain, whereas the other 18 square miles don't? I would assume not. I think it's probably an average across the entire county, but or the entire city, but I'm not sure. Or uh, how about this? Out of the uh, 24 hours, uh, they are 10%. Um, it's 2.4 hours raining, whereas the uh, the other remaining hours do not have rains. Okay, so. Um, in weather forecasts, the probability is usually calculated as uh, uh, compared to historical data with the same condition. The condition could be about uh, pressure in the air uh, and moisture in the air and the time of the year, uh, all these factors. With all these controlled, the chances or the probability of uh, having a rain on this similar day throughout the history. Out of uh, 100 days, there were um, 10 days that had rains. So this is uh, usually how a um, probability of rain is defined. It's in reference to all the historically similar days. However, in other cases, the probability could be interpreted slightly differently. So for example, um, a probability is also quite often used in medical, uh, medical studies. For example, if I say um, the probability of uh, getting breast cancer among humans uh, was 0.5%, what does it mean to you? Could uh, one of you uh, provide a um, your interpretation? Uh, that's. I'm sorry, this is Desiree. Would you first need to account for the fact that you would need to be? I guess maybe you would, would you need to see if there's a different rate between male and female, and would you need to calculate the percent of the population that is male and female? Oh, I see. Well, good point. You are. One step uh, ahead of me already, I was trying to bring up the uh, gen uh, sex uh, difference later. But if I just give a statistic saying that among uh, humans, the, ch the probability of uh, developing breast cancer was uh, half, uh, half, a, half a percent, uh, what does it mean to you? So Jerry, are you talking, are you looking for uh, information about the sample space being collectively exhaustive? In other words, you're either human or not, and you get cancer or not? Oh, whether human. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, we were talking about humans. <laughs> I think we're overcomplicating it. If I were to go and okay. simplify it, for at half a percent, I think one out of every 200 people uh, are susceptible to getting breast cancer, would get breast cancer in this case. Uh, yeah, that's a very intuitive uh, interpretation. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, now, since one of you already realized, this breast cancer has a huge uh, sex difference. It's much more, uh, much less likely for a male to develop uh, breast cancer at all. However, it's still possible for males to developing uh, to to the develop breast cancers. Um, but the difference between um, male and female in this specific disease can be uh, many times fold. So speaking of that, if I later uh, provide statistics, uh, for, for example, about uh, uh, women specifically, if I say, the chances or the probability of a woman to develop breast cancer is 1%. Um, here, there's a very important concept that we just learned in the past week. That's conditional probability. So why we have uh, two different statistics. Remember uh, earlier we just, uh, 
the, in the example I used that uh, among humans, the probability of breast cancer was a half a percent, but among women specifically, it suddenly becomes 1%. It's double the size. Here, uh, we are seeing the effect of uh, having a um, conditional probability. Previously, if we do not have the condition that, uh, um, that, that a person is a woman, then we do not have additional information regarding whether we are talking about men or women. So if we assume that uh, there are roughly equal uh, population size of men and women, then the, uh, it, at the same time, um, nearly none of uh, men had breast cancer, then it's reasonable to assume that the chance of uh, breast cancer among women would be double the size of that among both sexes. So that's why we see if we use conditional probability, the calculation would be slightly different. We have to, in this case, take, uh, take account for the sex difference. If I already know a person or a patient is women, then we know more about the uh, chances or probability of developing breast cancer. It'll be different than the prediction of probability without knowing the sex of a uh, patient. And uh, in our week five homework questions, we see immediately, uh, immediately in the first problem, it's about um, conditional probability. And we are comparing um, the probability of uh, positive COVID test um, and also uh, and uh, false positive um, COVID test with another event that's um, actual infection. So notice that in our homework question, there are two events going on. One is about the test. The other is about the actual um, the actual uh, virus infection. However, they are related. That's why we see uh, the calculation is is uh, is related to uh, each other. So that uh, um, the result of getting a positive or negative test uh, has uh, says something about whether a, a patient is actually infected with COVID or not. So, so by this I time, I oh, any I questions? questions? Uh, I did not hear you. So, uh, which could you speak again? I'm not hearing anything. I hope it's not because Zoom today is just uh, not working that way. Well. Oh, go for it, Jerry. So, uh, okay. Oh, uh, did you have yeah. a question? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, interesting. Uh, If you're looking for questions, Jerry, hi, it's Lindsay. And hi. just like last week, I really appreciate when you start at the top and then you move your way down through a question. Okay. And um, I got uh, the first question, but I don't fully understand the second part. I think I'm using the wrong spreadsheet. And also I just started on this today. So okay. I am not a reliable source. I see. I'm not sure which, uh, okay. In problem one, we don't have to use a statistics Excel sheet at all. In fact, we don't have to use any Excel sheet, but in problem two and three, we will have to rely on the statistics Excel sheet. Are you all able to find the uh, Excel sheet that you need to use? 
Yes. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, glad to know that part. Those Excel sheets, uh, as reviewed in the beginning of the quarter, is uh, hidden here in our um, Canvas, uh, Canvas web page under Google Docs and Files. One of them is named uh, Statistics. So uh, we have to use this one to calculate certain probabilities in problem two and three. However, in problem one, uh, let's look into it. We have some concept that's called prevalence, proportion of infected people. It's also probability. And in this case, uh, it's about COVID-19, right? And uh, it's about 10%. So here, this probability is actually getting infected with uh, COVID. However, um, there are also tests developed specific specifically for COVID viruses. This test, it works well, but it's not 100% accurate. As it says here, there are 2% false positive and 4% false negative. So there are chances of uh, getting false results. However, uh, one question here. What do you think this false positive mean? And uh, what do you think this 4% false negative mean? Any, uh, what are your understanding? A false positive means that you tested positive but don't actually have COVID. And a false negative means you tested negative but you do actually have COVID. Mm -hmm. There's a 2% and 4% chance of that being true respectively. Oh, okay, uh, great answer. I think you are mostly correct. Um, I might miss some part in the beginning so I was not entirely sure. So as the uh, name indicate, if one person is having a false positive, first we know that the test result is positive. However, it is false. So it means that if, if the test result is saying a patient uh, have a positive test, it means uh, the test would prefer uh, the answer that a person is infected. However, it's false. It means the person is actually not infected. So that's it, what means. And what's more important is that it's a conditional probability. Um, with this hint, what do you think the condition is here? And how would you interpret this conditional probability? Any tentative answers? So a false, a false positive would mean that there's a 0 0.02 chance that you had, you didn't have COVID, but conversely, it would also mean uh, that the complement to that would be a, a negative test, you'd have no COVID 0.98 or 98% chance. So the complement to the 2%. Ah, uh, okay. Um, great uh, part. I, uh, let's see. Um, well, maybe we will have to get into a practice so we know whether your answer is totally correct. I might have uh, lost some uh, details within. So to interpret this um, conditional probability, first we need to understand what's the condition and uh, what probability we're talking about. Here, the condition is that the test is say, saying positive. So we know already what the test result is. So there's no chance or remaining information we need to know about test result. So given a person has a positive test, what's the chances of uh, um, getting infected with uh, COVID? or what's the chance of uh, the, the patient is not getting infected with COVID. So this positive actually tells us about the latter part. If a person has a positive test result, 
what's the chance or probability of this patient, this particular patient with a positive test result uh, are not uh, actually infected with COVID at all. So with that, we can also easily move on to a false negative rate. That means the test result is already known. It's a negative, however, it's false. It means the patient is actually infected with COVID. However, um, it's also a conditional probability. Now, uh, this is a second um, scenario where we need to interpret a conditional probability. Would another student like to try how you would interpret this given that it's a conditional probability? You could say th something like, uh, given that a, a patient uh, is blah, blah, uh, then we know uh, something. Okay. No takers. <laughs> Interesting. I'm going to co uh, comment area, realizing that uh, you are uh, doing some calculation results. Uh, okay. Well, I'm. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, Sorry. Uh, blah blah. Would you like to try? Huh. No. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of falling, but I'm not. But uh, I will say blah blah blah. Eighty-four point two one percent are positive. Wait, oh. Um, or, or I guess we wanted to say it is 80, 84 point. Ah, you are already percent. getting uh, too much ahead already. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, I should be glad about it, I guess. Uh, I was yeah. asking about what, how would you interpret this 4% false negative rate? Oh, I can do that too. The false okay. negative rate would be the percentage of 4% um, of people who are actually infected with uh, COVID uh, received a negative test result. Wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, that's a great answer. Uh, but you could uh, follow a formula if you are requested to interpret a uh, conditional probability so that you're for sure you're reaching the correct one. Uh, let me put my notes in the practice area. So I guess we could follow this probability uh, section. So conditional probability, we usually, uh, well, let me enlarge it. Okay. We really represented by uh, a equation or formula like this. Remember, it's uh, sometimes it's quite it can be quite helpful to uh, use a formula, and uh, it consolidate a, lots of information in it. So that whenever we recall a formula, we can always uh, getting into the essence or the nature of the concept. So if uh, a conditional probability is given in this um, um, style, then when we interpret it, it will be something like uh, given that B happens, the, the chance or probability of A happens is uh, uh, this much, right? Then it can be very different than if we do not know what B happens, uh, whether B happens or not. So for example, in this case, without the test result, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, oh, well, it's not very difficult. Uh, without the test result, the only thing we know is the prevalence of uh, COVID, that's 10%. However, uh, talking about one person having um, a 10% of chance to uh, of COVID in specific scenario is not 
uh, enough uh, to have a safe conclusion. For example, if it's about um, custom entrance, many countries still require test results. And this prevalence, that's 10%, is not satisfactory. Uh, usually the officials want to know much more than just this 10%. They want to have statistics that's more reliable. Uh, that's why uh, this uh, here uh, we have uh, this uh, conditional probability. So what we can know is that uh, a conditional probability can be very different from a non-conditional one. Yeah. All right. Now let's get uh, into some calculations here. So here using this. Um, representation, we know that uh, the question reveals three pieces of information. First, we know that uh, COVID prevalence, this is not about the test, okay? It's about COVID. It's 10%, so it's 0 0.1. And we just uh, also knows two conditional probabilities. They are regarding a positive rate and a false positive rate and a false negative rate. These, as we discussed just now, are conditional probabilities. The, well, the uh, condition for the first one false positive is that if um, a person is not having COVID, no COVID, but a positive test. Man, I think I made a mistake earlier. Did I just flip these two parts? I believe I did that. Ah, sorry. Uh, so that's why for me, it's always more reliable to use uh, the formula, I think I mistakenly uh, said uh, the other way. Uh, we also have a false, uh, uh, false negative rate, right? So that's uh, the false negative rate means if a person actually has COVID, but when this person takes a test, the result turned out to be negative. This chance is not that high either, it's uh, 4%. So this is the pieces of information reviewed from uh, the question. Uh, do you all agree with me? Any questions so far? No, that's correct. Ah, okay. I think I, uh, yeah, misinterpreted these uh, uh, conditional probability earlier. So uh, let's, take another look back at these. Well, this 2% means is that if a person actually does not, uh, well, did not get infected with COVID. But, uh, when the person takes a, a test, the chances of uh, getting a positive result uh, is uh, two out of uh, 100 tests. Yeah, so um, it says, uh, this can be interpreted in somewhat different ways. You could say uh, for 100 people that takes tests who did not have COVID at all, two out of these 100 test takers would uh, have a positive test result. However, you could also say if a person who did not have COVID are going to take a test, 100 times repeatedly. Two out of these 100 tests taken by this specific person uh, would have uh, two um, 
times of uh, positive results. So in fact, the, um, the latter interpretation is the more reliable way because here, uh, if we are talking about this probability for a specific person, we are removing differences between persons. So any differences in their uh, possible uh, genetics or uh, genome traits are going to be removed. So we could do the same thing for here. Uh, it says that uh, if uh, the negative, false negative, right? False negative is 4%. It means if a person actually did get infected with uh, uh, COVID, when this person uh, takes a test, the chances of uh, getting a negative result is. Uh, four out of uh, 100. As we discussed just now, this four out of 100 could be understood in a way that uh, out of 100 people who did not have COVID, when they take tests, four out of these 100 people would have uh, negative results. You could also say for a person uh, who ac actually has COVID, um, out of 100 tests this specific person takes, four out of them would have negative result. All right, once we know uh, the correct ways to interpret these COVID uh, conditional probabilities, we could also further easily calculate a few associated probabilities. The Property of uh, um, pro uh, the property of probability is that they always sum up to one. So, how do we uh, have the complement uh, from this two percent? If we know the chance uh, it, for per people who did not have COVID, if we know the chance that they have. Pos a positive test result is 2%. We also know the chance of their negative result because there could be only two possible test outcomes, right? Either it's positive or negative. If we know the information regarding the positive part, we also know uh, the remaining part for the negative test. So out of here, we know that uh, if a person ha has who has no COVID at all, the chance of getting a positive test is 2%. Then we also know the the chance of having a negative result is one minus this part. Do you all agree with me? So we know that uh, the- Makes sense. Uh, yeah, we're with you. True negative part uh, or true negative rate would be 0. I find it to be um, not so safely concluding if I do not depend on this formula. So uh, if you have your own ways to understand it easily and also correctly, um, please let me know. I'd be happy to learn. <laughs> However, the, the way that I get uh, always get correct result is that I use this formula. Otherwise, I could, yeah, conceptually, without using this formula, it's somewhat more difficult for me to get the correct result. Okay. Um, how did you calculate this part? Uh, and if it's different, please let me know right now. Uh, it'd be great. So, um, here, we could also easily adapt the same principle to the next part. If we know the probability of uh, uh, this is false negative, right? So this is conditional on a person is already infected with COVID. The probability of uh, getting a negative test result is 4%. So that means that the remaining part, the specific person having a positive test result is the complement of uh, this 
4%. So we take this 4% out of 100%, what we have is the remaining 98%. If you use percentage, it's okay. However, in, um, at, well, academic publication, normally you see fractions, but when you interpret in probably, um, probably business reports or your client um, requests, things like this, if you use percentage, it might be easier to uh, interpret and uh, uh, transport or convey your findings. Uh, but make sure that uh, you understand what it means and uh, these two parts can be um, exchangeable. And uh, if you talk about probability, if it's conditional probability, realize what's the condition, uh, what we already know and uh, what we don't know, but we apply a probability on it. All right, and yeah, we move on. So with uh, these parts, calculated. Now, let's get into the um, so-called joint probability table. So, uh, okay, let me insert a table. We need a four by four table. So with this, just as how we practice during uh, the lectures, we could uh, um, put, oh, okay, the infection outcome here and put test result here. Well, let me move them outside. So we could also assign um, indicator numbers, but these are not going to be used however, uh, for this specific question. However, you could commonly see such tables that put zero on the upper left-hand side and put ones on the right bottom side. Now we need to fill in some uh, calculation here. What we are doing in this table is so-called the joint probability. So how do we calculate joint probability? We also focus on this type of uh, formula. So if we are calculating probability of uh, A, But what we know is this thing, this conditional probability, and also some other event probability. In this case, the probability of B. This is the formula we are going to use to calculate the event. So this is quite transparent for me. So if we already know the chance of observing or A happens, if we already know B happens, then once we times this probability with the probability of B happens, then we know that the chance of uh, uh, A happens is their multiplication. Uh, do you all agree with me in this part? Yes, thank you for explaining this so well. Yeah. So uh, let me, whether it's easier to, um, Inner, okay. Well, uh, how about we um, use the breast cancer case? If this is about uh, breast cancer, we know that uh, uh, you know fifty percent of uh, population are women, and uh, uh, among all humans, the uh, probability is uh, uh, half a percent as what we learned earlier, then we can calculate among women, uh, the probability would be uh, 
So in this case, um, we know uh, that uh, this is one event um, that will be, let's see. Oh my God. Okay. Am I just uh, making it more complex than necessary? <laughs> I hope not. Um, if uh, the, um, okay, we already know there's 50% and, uh, ah, okay. All right. So we just fill in the empty spot. So here we just need to fill in what is A and uh, what is B. Make sure you make this part right. Otherwise you could get very, very wrong uh, answers. So because we are, what we know here um, is some probability that do not have uh, conditions because you know we have uh, all humans, and we also know what among all population, you know, half are women. So there are about either probability of A or probability of B. Neither of these two percentage I gave here are conditional probabilities. However, we need to put in them in right place. So one of the things we know is that probability is always between zero and one, right? So we must find the relationship so that this conditional probability is also between zero and one. And it's only possible if we place the um, probability of, uh, uh, if we assign B to be the sex, whereas A is the chances of uh, cancer. So we know that A is about the breast cancer whereas B is about sex. So um, then we apply another, uh, if uh, this is 50% of a person, um, well, half a percent of a person to have uh, breast cancer at all, then we also have uh, this uh, A and B part, so now we calculate if we know a person is a woman, then the chance of a breakfast, uh, uh, <laughs> like breast cancer. Uh, we calculate this conditional probability in this way. Then we can also uh, have uh, this 50% of uh, uh, a person to be a woman. Now we can calculate what this part is. Uh, this has to be 1% to make this uh, formula work. So with that, we do the same thing with uh, the COVID case. We apply this formula four times to calculate uh, what these um, joint probability is. So here, Let's make one example, a joint probability between test positive and no COVID. See that none of these um, calculation were in this format. Remember that uh, this one is a conditional probability. Whereas this one without this uh, vertical bar is a joint probability. They are calculating very different things. Uh, whereas this conditional probability, we know for sure that for example, a person has no COVID or a person has COVID. In this joint probability, it's not the case. So this joint probability in uh, is expressed in this way. It is the chance um, that a person has a test uh, negative and also 
uh, no COVID. So see the difference between a um, interpretation of conditional probability and the one without conditional probability. If it's about conditional probability, we already know for sure about some part. But in this case, for joint probability, we are not for sure know whether a person has uh, a test result or uh, the uh, or the uh, infection outcome, but we know probability of both parts. That's the difference between joint and conditional probability. Any questions here? That sounds good. Okay. So, so, oh, sorry. You 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 gonna finish the uh, table there? Uh, yeah. Uh, let's move on. Um, we calculate a joint probability. Um, well, oh, maybe I should remove this tag. Um, this is probably uh, more about uh, conditional probability. Okay. Now, uh, calculate this part if I move on. Um, so with that, we also need to use uh, something related to the previous um, formula that uh, we used. So here, um, if we are calculating uh, this negative test result and uh, no COVID infection, it's also uh, in a form uh, in a form like this: the multiplication between two probabilities, and one of them is conditional. So here we would have to. Uh, have a probability of uh, um, no COVID, then we times that by a conditional probability that's under no COVID, we have a negative outcome, right? Now that's what makes this relationship complete. So here it says that we have the chance or probability of a person having no COVID. Then enter the situation, uh, what would be the chance of a negative test outcome? So that's why we times the uh, probability that goes into the conditions so that we remove the condition then two events are combined. Um, in, a very, uh, in a more general form, it'll be something like, uh, if we are calculating the joint probability of uh, uh, event A and B, and uh, what we know is actually um, this event happening, given that event B already happens, we just need to times this conditional probability with uh, the chance of event B happens. Then we know uh, the chance of uh, both event A and B happens altogether. Then applying this, we could easily calculate what happens here. So because we are calculating no COVID, right? So we remove this 10% um, out of uh, um, one because we already know the prevalence is uh, 10%, right? Then we just calculated this conditional probability, right? Uh, it is uh, here. So it is the um, difference between one and uh, um, the false positive rate. Now with this principle, you will be able to complete the other four. Just make sure that you understand what part you're multiplying 
and uh, what conditional probability you need to use. So I already demonstrated how you can calculate probabilities uh, like this and also conditional probabilities like the other. So we can also make it more complete thing that uh, if we know the prevalence, we already know the non-prevalence or the probability of uh, not having COVID. It's simply uh, the difference between one and uh, uh, the prevalence. Any questions in this problem? Sorry, I don't have a question, but I do have a question on some of the homework in, in general. Um, so on my, um, and thank you, by the way, that, that was fantastic. And um, yep. so, so to see, um, I really went back and forth, you know, on the the total loss that the company could could incur was 200 yep. or 250 times two tickets. So $500. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but in my answer, I was thinking, well, the probability, I times that by what I had was the probability of those tickets being um, not there was 21%. So I, I came up with a, a different number. So I, I guess Hi, the okay. question there Would is. You... Uh, okay, what's your question? Oh, so uh, the question yeah. is there it, it is, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not trying to like just do my homework for me. Is the thought right? Like is, obviously the company could pay $500, yes. Um, but I keep thinking like a, from a liability standpoint or, or a risk standpoint, are they multiplying that by the probability that not every time if they sold 60 tickets, would they pay $500? So I multiplied that by the probability that it doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, and, hi, I have a question uh -huh. to Jerry okay. on, sure. on that specific question. I use the binomial distribution mm -hmm. formula to come up with the answers. And all I have is a simple question. Do you add up to... Um, numerical values to come up with the answer one with x equals 59 and the other one where x equals 60 um, because n is 60 p is 0.98 x is 59 x is 60 you do that you multiply the 59 is 0 0.3644 times 250 because that's one ticket the one ticket right at 59 because there's 58 capacity and then the x60 is 0.2976 times 500 because you're two seats away from 58, you're at 60. And then I added those two answers to 239.87 is my answer. And I, for the life of me, I spent, I spent more time on that question <laughs> than any other question. That is the one question I have a question on and that's it. Cause it was, I really tried. So I just want to make sure that I'm on the right path or like Stephen, uh, I so yeah. much appreciate you, you bringing right that up. on that. So okay, that's here, what, I needed. what we are calculating is uh, uh, called expectation. The expectation is nothing but uh, the sum of uh, um, sum of uh, multiplications. It's the sum of uh, um, probability times the value. So we just need to calculate uh, the two parts, probability and value. So the probability is the chance of uh, having overbooked, right? But there are uh, the overbook could have uh, different um, stages. You could overbook by one person or one ticket. You could overbook by two tickets or three or four. In our case, uh, um, well, uh, I will have to go back to the question. Uh, to uh, make a, okay, it seems in our case, the uh, overbooking can only happen by uh, either zero or one or two, right? It can go no further. So there are only three scenarios. We just need to calculate the, uh, these statistics, the chances of these scenarios happen and uh, the value uh, or the cost uh, the, the airline has to pay under these uh, three different scenarios. Then we sum them up or we take weighted average, then we know the outcome or so-called the expectation of uh, uh, overbooking, uh, cost of overbooking. So, uh, but both of you are right that uh, you used binomial distribution. However, 
uh, do you uh, did the other students agree on this? Did you use uh, different distributions to calculate such uh, probabilities? Jay, can you show us how to use that with the um, uh, in in his statistics, the Excel sheet? Okay, uh, let's go to the Excel sheet. We have probability distribution. We have quite a few. There is a uh, binomial uh, Poisson and uh, uh, continuous uniform, exponential, normal, standard normal, and T distribution and chi-square distribution and F distribution. We will learn more about uh, the other distributions later. However, uh, we, we, we did discuss binomial distribution in the lecture, right? Have we? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then we know that binomial is that uh, uh, if we take a trial many, many times, and we also know some probability of uh, observing uh, in one success within one trial, then we can form a distribution regarding the number of total successes out of uh, a total number of trials. That's what happens in our uh, booking case. So here we have airline and uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, seats is uh, these many. However, the airline decides to sell uh, two tickets more, but it's not always that they need to uh, address these two additional passengers because not all passengers get on board uh, because uh, two have the chance, 2% uh, is the chance that a person with a ticket do not get on board an airplane, right? So here we need to understand the two parts. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the probability of success in, uh, uh, in, a, in a trial? And also how many trials we have. Uh, this is where some students disagree. Some use the number 58, whereas the others use the 60. So we for, for to to find out we need to first understand what this percentage or probability is. Uh, here it's represented as p and n. N is the total number of trials, and the p is uh, uh, a probability. So if we apply probability uh, zero point eight nine here, then we are saying this is the chance that a person, um, if a person has a ticket, right, then the chance of this person getting on board. So this is also sort of a conditional probability. We already know uh, it's a ticket holder. Um, and uh, then the chance of uh, a ticket holder getting on a board, uh, getting on a plane is uh, uh, 88, uh, 98 out of uh, uh, 100. Then with that, uh, we for sure will understand whether we should use 60 or uh, 55, because here this probability is regarding ticket holders. It's not the chance of uh, uh, passengers who are already on board, right? We are talking about uh, uh, the chance among ticket holders who would uh, move on to get on board. So that's why here, we should fill in the number of uh, ticket holders. That's why we should fill in 60 because the airline sold 60 tickets. Then we also need to calculate some um, values. So here X is the um, cumulative uh, number of trials that are success. In our case, it'll be the total number of uh, passenger, uh, total number of ticket holders who actually move on to get on board because we define the success as uh, a ticket holder going on board. Then, um, so Terry, shouldn't shouldn't it be 0.02 percent? For you um, could for, address for this the other way. Yeah. Okay. You could do it that way too. 
but the associated calculation would be slightly different than what I'm doing here. Okay. We could do both ways. If yeah, you're right. The success is totally arbitrary. You could define um, developing a cancer as success, or you could define surviving a cancer as a success. Uh, it's arbitrary. Gotcha. Then, um, so let's uh, start from maybe part A uh, so that we're on the same page. Okay. Now we know uh, tickets are sold, 60. The probability of not every ticket holder will have a seat on this flight. So, uh, all these three parts would uh, vary in terms of what x we need to fill in in our form. So for part A, we are answering the question regarding not every ticket holder will have a seat. So this is the chance that we have some overbooking, right? If we have the case where the number, uh, the, the ticket holders who get on board are fewer or uh, are equal to or fewer than uh, the seats, then we don't have this problem. We only have this problem when the number of uh, ticket holders going on board exceeds the number of seats, right? So what we are calculating in part A must be that uh, it's a probability of uh, x, uh, well, okay. That was intentional. X has to be greater than 58. Do you agree with me? This is what we need to do in part A. But we could also uh, understand that uh, this thing is nothing but uh, a um, sum of two probabilities. Recall that we have uh, sold only 60 tickets. So at most, we have a 60 ticket holders who can possibly get into an airplane. So in this scenario, we have, uh, uh, if we are calculating X greater than 58, we are also calculating the sum of the X equal to 59 uh, plus X equal to 60. So you could calculate this in either way. If you fill in, uh, for example, uh, 58 here, right? And we see that uh, there's a probability and a cumulative uh, probability. And um, we see one of uh, the answers looks somewhat similar to what we need to address. That's the last one, uh, 66%. However, uh, you could also move um, into these uh, cells to understand how it's calculated. Each of the probability, if it's not capitalized F, it's about uh, density. Here it's also called mass probability. That's why it has an equal sign. It's not cumulative. It's only describing one point. The probability of the uh, uh, x equal to 50% is this much. And in the second cell, we are instead calculating a cumulative probability. It's that x equal to 50% or x smaller than, uh, sorry, x equal to 58 or x smaller than 58. So by x smaller than 58, x could be 0, 1, 2, and 2, uh, 57. That's why we are, we are seeing that this cumulative probability is larger than the point, uh, uh, the mass probability above, because the latter one uh, has uh, more events accounted for. So, Jerry, that looks, that looks really good. Um, so, for 2A, okay. I, think, I think we all got 66.19, and then, nice. but B would be the 21.93, right? Uh, like we're not see. using we're not using the 33%, I think in this case. Let me uh go into part B. Uh I haven't uh carefully read that part. Uh, probably you're right. 
uh, pro in part B, we I'm right, need to calculate <laughs> the probability that a plane <laughs> is full, but no holder, uh, no ticket holder had to be turned away. Uh, let's see. Then X has to be 58. Yeah, so, so this exactly. Is in so then, yeah, I would think this is actually calculating what the uh, part B needs to address. Yeah, so, so part B, exactly. So no ticket, no ticket holder is the 21, but then any ticket holder would be the 66, I think. Uh, yeah, because in part A, we need to uh, answer uh, the probability of not everyone has a seat. That means at least one has yeah. a ticket, but not yeah. a seat, right? That's why uh, I illustrated we are we yeah. must calculate this quantity. However, yeah. I'm also showing that there are two ways to calculate that. Remember this uh, uh, probability here, right? So I'm yeah. going to paste it here. If we calculate the probability of uh, overbooking by summing the two scenarios of overbooking, overbooking can only happen if uh, there are 59 ticket holders yeah. getting on board and one of them do not have a seat or all 60 ticket holders get on, on board and the two of them do not have a seat. So we just need to calculate each of them. Then we fill in 58. Then we take notice here because we have to take care of X equal oh, I, to I do that. Then we can also uh, paste it here. Then we calculate again X equal to 60. Yeah, uh, and in these corner cases, you also notice that uh, this cumulative probability of uh, x smaller or equal to 60 is uh, 1, because, because this is this for sure, for sure. It, can no, uh, it cannot go anywhere beyond, and uh, uh, x cannot exceed 60. That's why the probability is uh, 0 here. Okay. Now we just need to test whether the sum of them is uh, this. So, uh, so, so why are you doing that, Jory? Um, mm -hmm. So the question again, again, not looking for the answer, but so the two C says about the tickets, you know, the cost to the airlines. Mm -hmm. So, so one answer is obviously the cost could be five hundred bucks to two fifty times two, but then. Uh, some of us calculated that by the probability that people wouldn't show up and we got 109. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess maybe some clarification on the question itself. I mean, because I, I think both those answers are correct. Like it, it could be from 500 bucks, no problem. Or it could be like from a, a liability standpoint that they're timing by the likelihood of. Uh, maybe uh, the reason you, you got a different answer is you, you have uh, overcomplicated the, the the case. I do. So um, I'm not really sure what liability you refers to, but uh, let's take a look at uh, Part C. The airline pays 250 to every ticket holders who does not find a seat um, because the plane is full. So what's the expectation of this pay? Then it's directly asking about overbooking. And uh, as we practiced just now, overbooking can only happen under two scenarios. Uh, if um, the number of uh, ticket holders is uh, getting on board is 58 or the number of uh, ticket holders getting on board is 60. In this case, 58, we have uh, uh, one um, overbooking, right? And uh, in the other uh, case, if we have uh, all 60 ticket holders getting on board, we have uh, nothing but uh, two overbookings. Uh, then we just need to take care of uh, what happens or how much to pay under each scenario. If we have one overbooking, how much do we pay? 250. 250. Then the other scenario of oral booking, we have two oral bookings. Uh, how much do we pay in that scenario? 500. 500. Oh, okay. Great. Then we need to calculate an average uh, to describe 
the expectation. Remember, in the beginning, we discussed what、uh, expectation is. It's nothing but weighted average, right? So we already know the probability. We already know the value under that probability,、um, or the cost under that probability. Then we、uh, calculate a moving,、uh, not moving here. I mean weighted average.、Uh, then it's just、uh, the probability of、uh, one case times how much we need to pay under that scenario. Then we take care of、uh, the rest. Uh, this is well, okay.、Uh, this is times uh, I uh, ten eleven. Okay. Oh ten. Okay.、Uh, I will. Yeah, this is the outcome I have here. So notice that what goes into the formula. This is how we calculate an expectation for、uh, discrete variable, because the cost we give out、uh, can only be integers、uh, of two hundred fifty, right? It's either two hundred fifty or five hundred or seventy.、Uh, well,、uh, actually, in the in our case, we won't have a three overbooking at all. So. Uh, we either pay two hundred fifty or five hundred, or we pay nothing if、um, there's no overbooking. But we're looking at this like kind of holistically, though. I mean, if an airline has a thousand flights a day or whatever, they're paying, you know, then over the course of a thousand flights, they're paying two hundred thirty nine dollars and eighty six cents or whatever over the thousand flights. Wouldn't that kind of be a better answer and how to answer C? No,、um, I'm not sure why you would、uh, factor in one thousand.、Uh, well,、flights. it doesn't need to be an. I just say that's just an example. So every、okay. flight they can they can assume to pay based on on these. Every flight, their you know their their cost is two hundred thirty nine dollars and eighty six cents for overbookings.、Mm -hmm. Even so, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be a manager then. Uh no, we are talking about、uh, one flight, right? We are not tie. We do not have to multiply this value uh with uh, the total number of flights. We don't know the total number of flights yet. Right? No, no, we don't know it, but like per flight, so because the answer is saying any、yeah. any given flight. Uh huh. Yeah, this is about a given flight. Notice that we have only sixty. Uh, tickets to address. Everything happens within the these sixty tickets. We are not、um, in this specific case. Although you can,、um, we would call this as、uh, generalized, right? You could generalize the result to other flights, but these calculations are for a given flight or a random flight. You could say that way. Then, using this outcome, if you want to calculate the expectation, if we are running, say, one hundred or one thousand flights, you just time this expectation for one flight with the total number of flights. Then that'll be the expected value of the overall booking cost among all.、Uh, Among all the number of、uh, flights we have、uh, in operation, Jerry, maybe maybe John or somebody already asked this, or you've answered it. But in one B or two B, you're disregarding the fact that the plane holds fifty eight passengers. You're just looking at it as an isolated, right? Because you have sixty in there. Uh, yeah. We illustrated、uh, why we fill in sixty instead of fifty eight in this case. Would that be your question? Why we are not using fifty、uh, eight? Yes. In place of n. Yes,、okay. I think you answered it. I just want to be a hundred percent sure you're disregarding the fact that the flight only has fifty eight seats. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah, not exactly. I'm taking、uh, account for that. In calculating overall booking probabilities, yeah. So why we use sixty instead of fifty-eight again is that uh, uh, it's related to the probability because this probability is assigned or is regarding ticket holders instead of、uh, 
holders who uh, ticket holders who already get on board. So we must apply the number of trials regarding to the uh, probability so that they match. So okay. Jerry, can I, can I just clarify? So N is the number of um, trials. trials, which would be ticket holders because all, all 60 yeah. could, you know, be, uh, uh, you could conduct a trial on all 60, whereas X yeah. is the number so, of successful. You're right. Uh -huh success measure right so mm -hmm. if you say everyone got on the plane x would be 58 because 58 people were su successful or yeah. however mm -hmm. you want to find success is that right mm -hmm. yeah so uh as you just said n represents the number of tickets where x represents the number of ticket holders um who get on board so one student asked whether it's possible to use uh, two percent instead the answer is yes. If we use a different parameter, uh, 2%, we, st we can still uh, address this question. However, some of the calculations needs to be adapted. So uh, if we use 2% as the uh, probability, it means this is the chance of a ticket holder who uh, buys a ticket but did not get on board, right? who choose to not uh, get on board. In this case, we still have uh, 60 ticket holders. So that's why we need to fill in 60 for the number of trials. We're not talking about any chances of seats, right? The seats are already 58 there. Uh, it's no matter how many people you fill in there, it's always 58 seats there, right? So uh, we don't have to... Um, yeah, but Larry, Larry use that as uh, trials. Sorry, Jerry. I think Larry had mentioned putting a fifty-eight there. You're putting sixty there. I, I'm trying to process that as like sixty tickets were sold. Maybe, Maybe two people are people in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Bathroom. So if um, uh, sorry, uh, probably I, I should clear all the cells before it's getting uh, uh, not so clear. So, so I, so if I understand why the 60 was there and Ben, maybe this is like success doesn't necessarily mean like the reason he had 60 in there was because we were trying to find what, how much it was going to cost for overbooking. Mm -hmm. So success would include number 59 and 60 in that case. But if you're saying how many people got on the plane, the success X has to be capped at 58. That's why I think there was 60 in there. Cause we were still on part two C which you'd yeah. have to calculate what the price is for, mm -hmm. for 59 and what the price is for 60, since success would mean those two people didn't get on the plane and the airline would have to pay for those people, right? Is that right? Why you had 59 and 60 there previously, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, so as uh, I illustrated just now, uh, X equal to 59 means that uh, 59 ticket holders want to get on board. But because there are you know 58 seats, so one of them uh, has a overbooking, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, here I'm changing the parameters, so I'm trying to address the question in a different way. Uh, that's why if uh, you didn't follow what I illustrated earlier, uh, then here you're uh, I'm saying that on the left and on the right they are two distinct approaches to address the same question. Oh. All right, um, can I, should I move on? Uh, are you clear with what I'm doing here? I'm yeah. as clear as I will be, yeah. Oh, okay, so a second way of addressing the same question uh, where we have uh, 2% as the percentage, uh, as the probability. Um, is that we would have to change the X values. So under uh, scenario two, uh, let me move everything here. So it's, uh, they are not uh, mixing with each other. Um, in um, uh, method two, we have, uh, um, not, sh uh, not showing up uh, rate is, uh, 2%, right? On the left, it's method one. It's the showing up rate equal to uh, 89%. Uh, no, sorry, 98%. But here I'm using a different uh, 
contrasting method uh, so that I'm um, filling in the probability of not showing up. That's 2%. For part A, uh, if we are calculating the probability that uh, not every ticket holder we will have a seat on the flight, that means we have overbooking. So um, in this case, we have uh, to calculate uh, what X uh, represents and uh, the probability under it. So if this probability is not showing up, the X is also the number of uh, um, ticket holders who did not show up. Then we need to uh, find out the relationship between the number of uh, ticket holders do not show up and the probability of uh, uh, having overbooking. So the only chance, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, well, recall what happened earlier. Uh, the only, scenario that we have overbooking is that the number of uh, ticket holders who get on board exceeds 58. Then reversely, we could interpret that the same scenario so that it's the number of uh, ticket holders who did not move on to, uh, to get on board is smaller than how many? Uh, it'll be one or um, let's see. Um, two, no, no, it'll be one or zero. So once it's uh, that's clear, we need to fill in these uh, parameters. If we are calculating x smaller than one, this is the probability we need to take care of. So that means we are instead uh, calculating the number of the uh, Passengers who did not board would be smaller or equal to one. Then there are two cases, right? X either equal to zero or X either equal to uh, one. Then we apply the same concept for the other two parts of the question, then it allows us to get exactly the same answer. Um, are you all good on this? So no matter whether you use a, uh, method one, defining the probability of uh, as uh, showing up, or method two, defining the probability as not showing up, then you can, uh, both methods allow you to address the same question. But uh, remember to, assign uh, the number of trials correctly and also the number of uh, success correctly because they are related to how you define the probability. Well, I haven't gone into the comments. Uh, any questions that I haven't addressed? So, Terry, I know we're over time. Um... Oh, right. I think the last question I have personally is on uh, 3B. Okay. And that, uh, that's where we're dividing up the, um, the normal distribution into two parts and... Okay. Right, so I, I, I think you take part, let's, what did I do? Um, above five, which was 84%, and then below, you know, less than or equal to four, which was 30, 33%, and I subtracted the two. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sounds good to me. Uh, so my advice or suggestion is that uh, it, uh, it can be beneficial if we translate the, uh, the calculation to a, a, an equation like in this version. So it uh, gives us hints what we need to calculate. So uh, in this case, uh, let me review problem three again and uh, understand what we need to calculate. Okay, there's a complicated manufacturing process. We know it's normal distribution. It has a mean and also standard deviation. 
uh, part A, we need to calculate probability. It takes longer than five. It should be easy to calculate. However, in part B, we uh, are asked to have the probability of uh, between four and five. Um, this is exactly in, in a similar form as here. If we already know um, the probability uh, is from standard normal, then we uh, then it's a continuous variable, right? So we can calculate the um, probability of a uh, value staying between two limits as uh, the difference between two probabilities. Uh, it might be shown more clearer if I move it here. Uh, so does this answer your question? If you are calculating the value of x, say between 400 and 500, we just need to take the difference between the probability of the x smaller than 500 and x smaller than 400. In this case, we just, for the number of minutes, we just replace oh, 400 and yeah. 500 to four and five. Uh, then you should get it. Well, so that is the question. Um, what do we get? Um, but what? I oh, would say okay. that I, I, I did get, I got five, not the difference. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the same thing. So I got five and subtracted less than or equal to four. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, so you just replace these anchor points with uh, the uh, numbers here. That's for uh, five minutes, right? And uh, use uh, normal distribution. Yep. Here we have a place. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, maybe your question is regarding what, what this sheet uh, represents. Uh, so you're not sure which of these uh, outcomes you should look into. Is that is that uh, no, wait, but what's my question difficult? Is, no, no. I, th I think you had it right. So I just took. Um, let's see. Well, normal distribution. I I just took five from four. So kind of a basic uh, question in that sense. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. I'm showing that uh, if we need to calculate um, between five and. Uh, uh, four and five minutes, we just uh, use a similar formula, use, well, exactly the same formula, right? We just uh, take this probability uh, of uh, x smaller than five and probability that uh, x smaller than four. Uh, then that's it. Yep. And then you just uh, calculate the rest part. So, uh, notice here for normal distribution or for any uh, continuous di distribution, there's no difference between um, the probability of x smaller than four uh, and perfect. Uh, the probability of x equal to or smaller than four. So uh, in a different way, you could see that uh, these two parts are the same. Um, because uh, the chance that x takes exactly the value at four, um, that's exact value, uh, it, it's understood at zero for uh, continuous variables. This does not happen. Uh, we cannot apply th the same uh, for formula here or the relationship here for discrete or not uh, non-continuous variable. So I should probably notice here yeah. only. Okay, then we just uh, fill in these uh, parameters uh, to normal distribution. Uh, I recall that was 2.3 minute on average, right? Uh, oh, 4.3 and uh, 7 uh, and 0. 0.7, 4.3, 7. Then, for example, if we want to calculate the something about uh, the minutes smaller than four, uh, or related to uh, this minute equal to four, this notice here is uh, this non-capitalized or a lower case of f represents density. It's not a probability, so we rarely use this part. 
However, what's more uh, useful is uh, what's lying below. Here we are calculating x smaller than four. Then this could take a value of uh, any value below four uh, and to uh, negative infinity. On the other hand, this is the rest. We are simply calculating the probability that x exceeds four as one minus the probability of x smaller than four. So these two parts necessarily add up to one. You can check that. So the sum at the bottom corner tells you that uh, these two cells sum up to one. Hey, Jerry, can I ask you just a quick question on number one again? Oh, uh, sure. Mac. So based on how you said on number one, you would just do, you know, one minus the prevalence times the probability of the event. But then we're missing one step, right? The denominator to actually get the number. Uh, denominator. Uh, right, because, okay. Because, because it's asking us for test positive and COVID. Mm -hmm. But if you do what you just did here, you just get 0 0.096, but I don't think that's right. Okay. Uh... Right, Point I times I well I don't think there's anything wrong here. Yeah, so uh, we so are like this one here. The first one you say that the probability of you have not having COVID and testing negative mm -hmm. is one minus point one times point nine eight, which equals point zero nine eight, right? this much let's uh uh let's see 0. 0.9 and uh, 0. 0.98 um okay it'll be 0. 0.9 taking away of uh, uh oh sorry never mind i i, I, I just th figured it out i just figured it out it, this should be the outcome we take uh 0. 0, 0, 0.008 away from 0. 0.9. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I, you I missed it. some part inside. Uh, yeah. I, I got it. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, if it. you're ever in doubt, uh, uh, what works for me is to rely on the formula. So this yeah. is the formula I use to calculate joint probability using exactly the same form as what's shown here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Oh, uh, any questions? Yeah, Jerry, I hate to beat a dead horse, but I got so many conflicting answers on 2B. I just are so you many? Kind of, okay. <laughs> are you are you is it just based off of one? Right? Do I just use one independent or am I using the 58 and 59 and then averaging them? I, I I've heard so many things, I don't know what to think anymore. Uh, no, we don't average. In part B, we are calculating uh, what 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 are we calculating? You're asking about problem two part B, right? Yes. Uh, well, see, uh, let's understand uh, the situation first. We need to address an event that the plan is for but no ticket holder has to be turned away. When does that happen? It happens only in one scenario uh, that uh, 58 out of 60 ticket holders get on the plane, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so all of them get seats and no one were turned away. So that means uh, um, X in this case, if you define the, probability as uh, now showing, it'll be uh, 58 there. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, in this case, it won't be 58. Uh, it'll be let me just make sure. Um, it'll be two. Um, oh, because 0.02. Okay, but I had 98. Yeah. Let me change that. Yeah, if you have uh, 
Um, point 98, uh, let's start from the beginning. I'm uh, using method one so that uh, uh, the probability is showing up, 98% uh, um, uh, chance of showing up. Then uh, observing all ticket holders getting on board without uh, anyone turning away is that uh, only 58 ticket holders out of the 60 get on board. So in this case, we are calculating this uh, yeah. probability okay. mass. Yeah, that's what I had. Uh, and then through this conversation, it turned into 29.76, which is if you put a 60 in the independence there in the X. Uh, no, uh, you don't do that. Uh, okay. I did that because I'm showing uh, you can calculate this probability using the sum of the uh, two events. Because in part A, we are calculating a different probability, and that's the probability of overbooking. And overbooking takes um, have, takes place in two scenarios. I'm illustrating that uh, what the two scenarios are. And uh, one of the scenario is that X takes a value 60. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I hope you have a wonderful week. I I think oh, Jerry, I'm Jerry. Just, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, one last question. Uh, thanks and, for coming uh, back. For, <laughs> for three, uh, it was 3B. I don't okay. understand. Why are you subtracting the probability that X is less than four? It, isn't it if you want to find something between two numbers, it, it would be greater than or equal to four and then less than five? Ah, or less than okay. and equal to five. Yeah, less than equal to yes. Oh, I'm doing this because uh, I did address uh, what you are uh, looking for. So um, I still consider the best way is to uh, go back to this formula. First, we are sure uh, you. I believe you agree with me. We're calculating probability that X lies between four and five, right? Yes. yes. So we know the left-hand side of uh, this equation is uh, okay. But we also need to see what this represents. Um, here it says that X lies between four and five. So it, can, uh, it has uh, uh, two components. If... Um, we are uh, we if we are addressing uh, if we are calculating this probability, we need to use some properties regarding um, normal distribution. We are removing the part that's extra uh, away from uh, the quantities we already know. So if we if we can calculate the probability that x smaller than five, there are additional things we take into, right? There are values, for example, x are between zero and four. This should not be in our final result, but this quantity x smaller than five has that part, right? So we need to remove that part. How do we do so? We take a difference. We remove the part that uh, x smaller than five, uh, uh, x smaller than four. So the remaining part, that's the difference between these two quantities, is that x greater than four, but still smaller than five. I get it. I get it now. Okay, thank you. So yeah, it makes sense where we take uh, differences between probabilities. We are calculating the event that between two anchor points. So we are removing one uh, additional part away from it. Uh, another way to understand uh, is that uh, we could go to the union of events. So um, that uh, we need to remove the extra part. This is another scenario that we need to take a difference in probability. But uh, as we discussed in the beginning, uh, every probability, if it can be expressed as probability, 
it has to be between zero and one. So if you, you know, flip these two components, so you get got a negative result, you would know it's wrong. However, uh, when we take probabilities, sometimes we, we do get negative outcomes. And sometimes it makes sense. So for example, if we are um, uh, going back to the breast cancer scenario, because uh, males have uh, a lower probability of uh, getting breast cancer. So if we are comparing males with uh, females in breast cancer, we could say that uh, the difference is a negative uh, value. It means uh, males have a lower probability of developing breast cancer. But this quantity is not a probability. It's the difference in probability. All right, I also included uh, one note about uh, the difference between density. That's uh, what this uh, lower case of F shows in normal distribution, for example, and also uh, this standard normal distribution. It's different than cumulative probability. And you know, when we describe a probability, we normally use words like probable, probability, percentage, proportion, but uh, avoid use uh, using words like likely or likelihood or odds because they are describing very different and distinct uh, statistics. These should be reserved for statistics that are not probabilities. All right, uh, I hope it's- I'm sorry, I have a question for everything you just explained. Um, I understand conceptually yeah. what, uh, oh, nice. what we're- Yay, so yeah, the yeah. first step, I, I'm with you mentally, um, but is there, how do you figure that out into the Excel, um, the Excel spreadsheet into the template? I, I'm not really navigating this template effectively, I think. Can you show me how to do the, um, like the 2C part that you just went over with Tanya in the template? I- Or point me to which, um, distribution you were using? I was trying to use the normal distribution on the template and I don't think that's correct for that. No, it's not correct. I encourage you to <laughs> probably rewatch uh, the okay. recording once it's uploaded because I think I step-by-step -step illustrated why I chose binomial distribution oh, okay. and uh, how part C in problem two was calculated and uh, what formula I used and why it was done in that way and how it could be conceptually understood. Okay. So for problem three, just within the template to make sure I'm, I'm using the right one, the problem A, we're using the normal distribution and then B is binomial is what you've shown us, right? Is that correct? Incorrect. Uh, no, oh my incorrect. gosh. Both parts need to use normal distribution. These, mm -hmm. uh, which distribution you need to use, uh, usually comes from the question. Because here we already know that uh, the process follows a uh, uh, follows a normal distribution. So that's why we need to use normal distribution. Oh, because it says it right there in the question. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Uh, have a great night. Thank you for staying late with us. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I just realized it's too long. <laughs> yeah, I we're sorry. I didn't take too much of a time away from your homework uh, working. No. Thank you, Jerry. No, Thank it was you, Jerry. Good. I appreciate it. Uh, great night. Sure. Thank you. Bye.